Well, hello again. This is Alistair McGrath from Oxford, and uh, I'm very glad to be part of this series on Christian apologetics, which is being given at Regent College in Vancouver. And again, I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person, and also that I've had to record these lectures in my in my office because I can't get to a decent lecture theatre to record them. This eleventh lecture will explore the importance of finding meaning in life, and it's a really important question, I think. Let me begin by looking at a quotation from the American writer Edward O. Wilson. He writes these words, and I think you'll find them helpful. We are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. Let me read that again. I think it's a very good discussion starter. We are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. So his point is that we may live in an age of information, but it's certainly not an age of meaning. And a failure to find meaning in life can easily lead to despair. So the big item on our agenda in this lecture is this notion of meaning. What is it all about? What's life all about? And how can we begin to use this apologetically? And certainly this used to be one of the great questions discussed by philosophers, yet it does seem to have gone out of fashion in professional philosophical circles. You might think, for example, of the American philosopher Susan Wolfe, who has certainly written on this theme, but actually she's one of the very few ones to do so. And Susan Wolfe notes that it seems to make her professional colleagues cringe with embarrassment at times. Now, I'm not going to wait for the question of meaning in life to become philosophically fashionable again before I start talking about it, because most people already know that it's important and that it matters. Now, let me begin with a marvellous quotation from the novelist Jeanette Winterson. I gave you part of this in an earlier lecture, but I think really it needs to be cited more fully. And I think you'll find this very useful in your own thinking, writing and speaking. It's from her memoir, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal. So listen to what she says. We cannot simply eat, sleep, hunt and reproduce. We are meaning-seeking creatures. The Western world has done away with religion, but not with religious impulses. We seem to need some higher purpose, some point to our lives. Money and leisure, social progress are just not enough. So you see the point she's making, that actually meaning really matters to a lot of people. So I think we need to begin to think about what sort of things are associated with this rich and complex word meaning. So let's begin to explore this question. I rather like a phrase that I find in the writings of Sir Peter Medewer, who was a British biologist who championed the public engagement of science a couple of decades ago. He writes, only humans find their way by a light that illuminates more than the patch of ground they stand on. It's as if human beings seem to possess some desire to reach beyond the mechanics of engagement with our world and look for deeper patterns of significance and meaning. Now, as I'm sure you all know, the question of meaning in life is widely discussed in literature and, of course, in wider culture, as well as in some scientific circles, particularly, of course, psychology. Now, empirical psychology has highlighted how important the question of meaning is to human well-being. It's as if human beings seem to yearn to find a big picture of life, which helps us to feel that we're part of something that's greater than ourselves. Well, that's important, but let me make this point very clearly. Science can certainly help us to identify what sort of things people find meaningful. But I need to stress that is not the same as telling us what the meaning of life is. In the end, that is just not a scientific question. It's one of those many great questions that transcend science's capacity to answer. And Karl Popper, who was a very well-known philosopher of science, called these big questions ultimate questions. These relate to the great riddles of existence, like what's the point of life, what's the good life, and how do I lead it? And Popper's point is that science simply cannot answer these questions using its own proper methods but certainly it can tell us what sort of things we find meaningful. Now here's how the psychologist Michael Steger, who was founder and director of the Center for Meaning and Purpose at Colorado State University, explores this question of meaning. He tells us that it is to be understood as, and I quote him here, the extent to which people comprehend, make sense of, or see significance in their lives accompanied by the degree to which they perceive themselves to have a purpose, mission, 
or overarching aim in life. Now, I think you'll agree that's a very helpful start to our reflections. I'm sure already you can see some very interesting apologetic connections. Psychology may not be able to tell us what this big picture might be, but it can certainly show us how important it is for us to lead a meaningful and fulfilled life. So look at the key themes that Steger identifies. Making sense of life. Seeing significance in life having some kind of purpose in life. These are all importantly apologetically, but more importantly, I think, they are all answered richly by the Christian faith. So let me turn to a well-known quote which takes us in exactly the opposite direction from Richard Dawkins. And I'm sure many of you will recognize this quote. Dawkins says, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is a bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Now that's a very bold statement. Dawkins is absolutely clear. There is no purpose, there's no meaning, there's no evil, no good. But I have to tell you, that's just Dawkins' perspective. It's not a fact. It's the way he sees things. It doesn't have to be the way things are. So let's turn instead to Albert Einstein, who was a very great scientist, who was refreshingly aware of the complexities of the issues here and also the limits of the natural sciences. And I got to know Einstein's work really well as a thinker during my first year at Oxford University, and he remains an important influence for me to this day. In fact, I wrote a short book on his religious significance recently. Now, I hope I won't need to persuade you that Einstein's a scientific genius, but what I hope to show you is how an intelligent and reflective scientist reflects on the questions I'm raising in this lecture. So we're looking at a landmark lecture that Einstein gave in 1939. And he's talking here about science and religion and the meaning of life. And Einstein was clear that um, the natural sciences were outstanding in their sphere of competence, and yet he entered a note of caution. What about ethics? Or questions of meaning? Now, we touched on some of these when I was talking about science in an earlier lecture, but listen to this very important statement where Einstein really picks up on this theme in a big way. The scientific method can teach us nothing else beyond how facts are related to and conditioned by each other. And human beings, Einstein declared, need more than this, more than what he called a purely rational conception of our existence. And Einstein insists that the fundamental beliefs which are, and I quote, necessary and determinant for our conduct and judgments cannot be established scientifically. And Einstein was you know, really, really clear. This is not about a criticism of science. It's simply saying, look, this, this is science. It has limits, and we need to respect what those limits are. And Einstein was absolutely clear that going beyond science and the human quest for moral values and personal meaning was necessary. And it was not about lapsing into some kind of superstitious irrationality. So listen to what Einstein has to say on this. I think it's very interesting. I'll read it slowly. His English is a little bit clunky, but... I think you can see the point he's making. Objective knowledge provides us with powerful instruments for the achievements of certain ends. But the ultimate goal itself and the longing to reach it must come from another source. So what he's saying here, well, what he's saying is that science can help us achieve certain goals that we think are right, but it cannot in itself identify what possible goals are good and right, or motivate us to achieve them. This determination of what is good and the motivation to do good has to come from somewhere else, from somewhere that is beyond science. And again, this is not a criticism of science, it's a respectful acknowledgement of its limits. Science is a wonderful toolbox for exploring our world, it's just that we need other toolboxes as well. And of course, those who are, like Richard Dawkins, into scientific overreach in a big way will be annoyed at the suggestion that other sources of knowledge should be recognized and respected. But, you know, that's just the way things are. Science is great. It has its limits. It's precise. But it's unable to deal with questions of meaning and questions of ethics and morality. What is good? So let's just think about this a moment. Let's do a mental experiment. 
I want you to imagine I have a thermometer in my hand. Now, it's an instrument, it's a tool, and you know it works brilliantly uh, when I need to know my temperature, for example, in, in working out whether or not I might have COVID. So it's a great tool. It works well. Now, supposing I were to argue like this, listen very carefully. Because this thermometer works so well in telling me my temperature, why not use it for everything else? After all, it works very well in one specific area, so why not just extend its use to every area of life, including questions of value and meaning? Now, what I'm hoping you're thinking as you're listening to me here is that this is the most ridiculous argument you have ever heard. But I'm going to tell you, it's exactly the same structure as saying, because science well, works well in telling us how things work, we use it for everything. Supposing I wanted to know the meaning of life, so I take up my thermometer and I look at it, and for some reason the thermometer seems unable to answer the question. So I might conclude that because the thermometer has not detected any meaning in life, there is no meaning in life. See the point I'm trying to make? It really is important to appreciate that all our research tools are developed with some specific task in mind. And the fact that a tool works very well for one task doesn't mean it works for every task. A tool may be very good at measuring temperature or looking at the stars, but that doesn't mean that the same tool can tell us what is good or what the meaning of life is. It's the same with science. It works so well for some tasks, but not for all. We need more than science to answer life's big questions about meaning and value. And again, that's no criticism of science. It's simply saying, let's be respectful of its limits. Now, you remember, I think, in my second lecture, I talked about Christianity as providing a big picture of life. So let's see how this idea connects up with the quest for meaning. Now, philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein um, made some very interesting comments about how we achieve meaning and happiness. And he suggests that we, be, we, we find meaning, we, we're happy, when we believe that we are thinking and living in accordance with something that is deeper and greater than ourselves. Listen to what he says. In order to live happily, I must be in agreement with the world. And that is what being happy means. Now, Wittgenstein's right. It means we need to be able to grasp the big picture of the universe and position ourselves within it. We need to be able to see what that picture is and how we fit into it. So how does a big picture relate to meaning? Now, I'm going to make two suggestions which I think will help you reflect on this. First of all, it means that our universe is coherent. And secondly, it means that there's a place for each of us within it. Let me explain each of these ideas. I'm going to begin by looking at the idea of coherence, which is a really important theme in the New Testament letter to the Colossians, especially um, the signature of verse 17 of its first chapter, which declares that in Christ all things are held together. And the point being made here is that Christianity provides a web of meaning, a deep belief in the fundamental interconnectedness of things. It's like uh, standing on top of a mountain and, and you, you look down at a patchwork of villages, fields, streams and forests. And, you know, you can take snapshots of everything you see, the village, the field, the stream, the forest. But what you really need is a panorama that holds all these snapshots together. It embraces them all, but it positions them and lets you see how they fit into that bigger picture. That reassures us there is a big picture and that each little picture has its place within that greater whole. And many people fear the idea of incoherence, the idea that reality consists simply of isolated and disconnected episodes, incidents, and observations. Now, that's a very important point, because our modern age has seen many doubts about the coherence of reality, many of which are, arose from the so-called new philosophy of the scientific revolution. Do new scientific ideas destroy any idea of a meaningful reality? Now, that's not a new idea. Back in 1611, the English poet John Donne 
spoke movingly of his own concern over precisely this point, because it seemed to him that recent scientific discoveries and radical philosophies seemed to erode any sense of connectedness and continuity within the world. It is all in pieces, all coherence gone. He wrote of this unsettling new world that seemed to be opening up. How on earth could it be held together? Well, let's go back to Colossians 1, 17. I hinted this earlier, but let's just look at this in a bit more detail. Colossians 1, 17 speaks of all things holding together or sometimes being knit together. Uh, the basic idea is there's something holding them together in Christ. There's a hidden web of meaning and interconnectedness lying behind the ephemeral and apparently incoherent world that we experience. And you know, the British novelist Virginia Woolf uh, was a very interesting person because she occasionally experienced short stabbing experiences of insight, which seemed to her to reveal, and I quote, some real thing behind appearances. And these, these rare moments of being, as she called them, convinced her that there were hidden webs of meaning and connectedness behind the world that she knew around her. Yet, she found she could never actually enter this hidden world. Always seemed to retreat from her. She felt it was approaching it uh, and never managed to actually be able to pin this down. And that's why Christianity is so important here, because it provides us with a reassurance of the coherence of reality grounded in Christ. However fragmented our world of experience may appear, there is this bigger picture in which all things do hold together. It's threads connecting them together in a web of meaning. Things may look incoherent and pointless, but there is this bigger picture which holds them all together. And we need to know that. Because the British philosopher and writer Iris Murdoch, who wrote some wonderful philosophical novels you may have read, spoke of, and I quote, the calming, whole-making tendencies of human thought, by which she meant the ability of a big picture or a grand narrative to integrate our vision of reality. And Murdoch makes the point that we're looking for meaning in life, not just accumulating additional facts about life. And it's so easy simply to accumulate information, pasting new items into our mental notebooks, but we need more than that. Let's go back to that quote from Wilson right at the beginning of this lecture. He wrote, we are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. And that's a very important point. Now, in my fifth lecture, I quote from the American poet Edna Mille on the problems of finding meaning in a glut of facts. We need to be able to see patterns to discern meaning. And many scientists feel the same way. In a very important article on science and reality, the philosopher Michael Polanyi made a distinction between a noise and a tune. Now, both consist of sound waves, yet one seems to be ordered and meaningful, and the other chaotic and meaningless. And that's an important point. Confronted with a glut of information that we cannot process, we sometimes think we're living on the brink of incoherence and meaninglessness. Meaning seems to have been withheld from us if there's any meaning to be found at all. So some simply hear a meaningless noise. Those who know what to look for hear a melody, a tune. We've got to help people hear that tune. Now, I think there's some things that the Christian apologists can say to this concern about incoherence. Now, I'm going to explore this with you. I'm going to look, do this by looking at the four key elements of the idea of meaning. Now, my job in this lecture is not simply to explore the question of meaning with you, which is very interesting, but actually to show you how it's apologetically important and useful. So I need to help you think through how you might take this idea and actually do something with it. That's what we're going to do now. I'm going to draw on the analysis of the idea of meaning that we find in the works of the social psychologist Roy Baumeister, who served as professor of psychology at Case Western University from 1979 to 2003. And in 1991, he published a book which has become really a standard work of reference in this field, Meanings of Life. Let me tell you right away that this is not a book that tells you what the meaning of life is. It's much more interesting. It's about doing empirical studies which help us to identify the things that matter 
to people. So what I'm going to do is explain the four main things that Barmeister's research identified as being important to people, and then ask how we can engage them apologetically. And obviously I'm going to give you some examples about how you can use these four categories apologetically, but you know, this is where I hand over to you because in many ways you will be able to amplify these and do some very exciting things with them. So let's look at what these four approaches are. I'll describe them briefly and then we'll look at each of them in a lot more detail. So here's the first one. First one is the question of identity. Who am I? The second one is the question of agency and that one is really about whether I can make a difference. The third is about value. Do I really matter? And fourthly, the question of purpose. Why am I here? I'm sure all of you can relate to those questions very, very easily. In fact, you might like to reflect on which of these four themes matters most to you and the difference they actually make to you. You might also like to think, I wonder how Christianity speaks into each of them. So let's work our way through these and see if we can begin to expand what each of these means and make connections with core themes of the Christian faith that you can develop apologetically. So we begin with the first of these, identity. Who am I? I remember once um, uh, listening to a rather dull lecture with this punchline, where nothing more than atoms and molecules get used to it. It was a rather dull lecture, I have to say. And uh, this highly reductive model of human nature is found in the writings of the biologist Francis Crick, who defined human beings in purely neurological terms. Listen to this, I'm sure you know this quote. He writes, you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You're nothing but a pack of neurons. That's a very bold statement um, and it's attracted a lot of attention. If he's right, human beings can be defined simply and neatly in terms of one of our physical components, which certainly plays a critically important role in our lives, but Crick treats it as being determinative and identity giving. But we need to critique this because it really is very shallow and simplistic. Crick's highly reductive approach to human identity assumes that a complex system is no more than the sum of its parts, and that one of those components can be singled out as being of defining importance. I think, uh, you know, if I was being really generous, I think that I would say the best way of understanding Crick's helpless overstatement is to suggest that it's a neurologist perspective on human nature, which somehow manages to overlook the fact that there's a lot more to human nature than neurons. Now, let's agree that we all need neurons if we are going to function properly. I couldn't give this lecture and you couldn't listen to it without them. But there is rather a lot more that needs to be said. So let's, let's illustrate this by moving on to another very reductionist approach to human identity. And this again is Richard Dawkins, we're coming back to him his so-called gene's eye view of human nature. And this attracted a lot of attention back in the late 1970s and 1980s, although it has rather fallen out of favor since then. And this approach sees human beings essentially as machines which are controlled and determined by our DNA, by the complex biological molecule, which transmits genetic information. Listen to what Dawkins says. DNA neither cares nor knows. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. And our sole purpose in existing is simply to pass our genes on to future generations. In other words, human beings are just gene-perpetuating machines. Okay, you can see why I got some media attention, but you can also see what the problem is. And the problem is simply that you privilege one perspective of reality. You overstate its importance. Dawkins is certainly right to argue that human beings want to pass on their genes, even if they might not use this specific way of talking about this urge or instinct. But it's just one aspect of our complicated identity. Again, it's part of the picture, but it cannot conceivably be seen as the whole picture. 
Now, the point I'm making is that it's very easy to give hopelessly reductionist accounts of who we are. We are told that we're defined by our genetic makeup, by our social location, and countless other scientific parameters. We can be defined by our race, our nationality, our weight, and our gender. Yet all too often, identity is simply reduced to the categories we happen to occupy. Here's a glass of water, which I'm going to drink to keep my throat nice and moist. That glass and water consist of atoms and molecules. So do I, so do you. If you can't tell the difference between a glass of water, you and me, something's wrong. And the curse of the scientific age is that human beings are simply reduced to genetic or scientific stereotypes so that individual identity simply becomes a matter of chemistry or physics or biology. It's not. It transcends all of these things. Now, as you might expect, powerful protests have been raised against this depersonalization of identity. One of the best examples is the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, who argued that purely scientific accounts of humanity reduce people to objects, to an it rather than a you. And for Buber, the essence of personal identity is an ability to exist in relationships. We're defined not by our chemical or genetic makeup, but by our social and our personal relationships. An identity is therefore something that is given, not something achieved. I'm given my identity as a father by my children. I'm given my identity as a person of significance by the God who has graciously chosen to relate to me and to regard me in this way. Now, this really is a central element of the Christian vision of personal identity and meaning. We find it in a significant relationship, and people know all about the importance of relationships for meaning and identity and a sense of self-worth. The really important point here is that for Christian, Christianity, we don't define ourselves, but we're defined by our relationship with God, which gives us and safeguards our identity and significance. We matter profoundly to God. And you can link this in with the themes we looked at in earlier lectures about the importance of God's love for us shown in Christ's death on the cross. Now, Augustine of Hippo, you remember I talked about him in an earlier lecture, made this point very clear in his Confessions. And for Augustine, human destiny and identity are both linked with God as our creator and redeemer. And he expressed this idea in a famous prayer. I quoted in an earlier lecture, but I'm going to quote it again because it's so relevant to this aspect of meaning. You have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. And so the key point here is that coming home to God is about, in effect, rediscovering our identity. Uh, it's all about finding rest in God. And Augustine's setting out here a very powerful narrative of restoration and homecoming. We are not fully human. We don't achieve our full potential until we exist in relationship with God. It's a core component of the Christian understanding of human identity. We don't achieve our potential. We don't become what we're really meant to be until we relate to God. So, how can we use this apologetically? Well, I'm sure you've had lots of ideas as I've been speaking, but let me just focus on a story I remember reading once as a child. It was all about someone who seemed terribly unimportant and insignificant. Then they discovered that really, they were the long lost child of a king. They were special, but they didn't realize it. Now, okay, it's not, not a great storyline. It seemed to me to be rather fun when I was about 10, but, uh, you can see, nevertheless, the point it makes. Christianity allows us to see ourselves in a new way. We matter to God, who offers us acceptance, friendship, and transformation. So let's move on now and look at the second major theme, which is to do with agency. The question here is, can I make a difference? Now, I wonder how many of you have seen the 1946 movie, It's a Wonderful Life. It wasn't actually a very big commercial success at the time, but it's now widely thought one of the best movies ever made. So what is its central theme? Why did it resonate so strongly with its audience over the decades? Well, 
It's all about someone who thinks he's a failure, whose life has been a waste of time. And then he comes to see that actually he made a difference, a big difference to a lot of people. It's just he didn't know this. Now, I think that's a very important point because, as I'm sure you can understand, the capacity to make a difference to things, a difference to people, is seen by a lot of people as integral to their quest for meaning and purpose. If I cannot make a difference, then, well, I might as well not be here. Do we have what it takes to make a difference? That's a very important theme. Because for Christians, it's not just about making a difference, it's about being enabled to make a difference by divine grace. And from a Christian perspective, human nature is damaged and wounded by sin and is not able to achieve its full potential unaided. But we are healed by the grace of God and enabled and empowered to make a difference, even though we may see ourselves as weak and insignificant. Now, I know that probably seems very abstract, so let me try to flesh it out a little bit by referring to C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, especially the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Now, throughout the Chronicles of Narnia, we find this um, really important exploration of this deep human intuition that our own story is part of something grander. And once we've grasped this, this bigger picture, it allows us to see our situation in a new and more meaningful way. And Lewis here picks up on the very Christian idea that we're each individuals with our own unique story, but that we can become part of some greater enterprise, a bigger story, and in doing so, make a difference. It's all about being inspired by Aslan to make that difference. And what we see in the Chronicles of Narnia is people animals sometimes, often humble and lowly, realizing that they can become part of this greater story. Without losing their distinct identities, they can enter into this greater story and gain value and meaning and purpose within it. So in one sense, faith is actually about allowing our own stories to become part of this bigger and better story of God, knowing we have an important role to play in advancing that bigger story. So how do we use this apologetically? Well, I think you can already see some really interesting possibilities here. In this context, I talked about the importance of stories, and I suggest you might think of your own story and how that might be apologetically significant. And maybe some of you who are listening to me now could tell a story of how you stepped into the Christian big picture, the Christian story, and realize the difference that this made to you and you could make to it. So maybe you could help someone else to imagine what the life, what life and the world looks like from a Christian perspective and how this contrasts with the way their present worldview understands things. But there's a lot more to say on that theme. I'll leave you to think about that and work out your own particular approach. Because we need to move on and look at the third of these four elements of meaning. And the third is the idea of value. Do I really matter? Now, you may remember in my opening lecture in this series, I spoke about my own sense of complete insignificance as a teenager when I looked at the three stars that are commonly called the belt of Orion. And light leaving those stars now wouldn't arrive on Earth for hundreds of years, by which time, of course, I would be dead. And so you can see why the night sky became for me as an atheist then a symbol of meaninglessness and hopelessness. And I remember reading a novel by Joseph Conrad, which seemed to express my feelings at that time very well. And Conrad spoke of how, listen to this, dewy, clear, starry nights crushed us by the brilliant evidence of the awful loneliness, the hopeless, obscure insignificance of our globe lost in the splendid revelation of a glittering, soulless universe. So that's what I thought when I was about 13 years old. But it's not what I think anymore. And you'll remember I cited Marilyn Robinson on Psalm 8 in an earlier lecture, and that's a very good place to go to begin to explore this issue, because the text of Psalm 8 speaks powerfully about 
these concerns. The psalmist considers the immensity of the night sky and then turns to consider the place of human beings who are very small in this vast universe. So here are some words from Psalm 8. Listen to them, you'll know them very well. Figure out how you can use these apologetically. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. In other words, it's a big universe, but we are creatures of the same God. We're endowed with dignity by the fact we've been made by God. We may be small, but we are the creation of a great God who knows us, cares for us, and names us. That's a very important theme. Individuality matters. The care of God for humanity is emphasized throughout the Old Testament. To give you one very important theme, God is our shepherd who accompanies, supports, and upholds us even in the valley of the shadow of death and even when we feel completely insignificant and unimportant. And the New Testament adds a new dimension to this, reaffirming the love of God for humanity while linking this to the death of Christ as a tangible, a visible demonstration of this commitment and compassion. Think of one of Paul's very famous declarations of this point, Galatians 2.20, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the key point here is that the death of Christ solidifies this point. We matter to God. If you doubt it, look at Christ on the cross. He did that for you and you matter. So interestingly, from a Christian perspective, our value doesn't really depend upon our, our achievements, but rather in our relationship with God. God is, to use a very powerful phrase developed by the British psychologist John Bowlby, our secure base. Again, our secure base. God is like a loving parent who provides the unconditional love and acceptance that's needed if a child is going to grow up and learn from mistakes. And we need that secure base to cope with personal challenges and difficulties. Or you might think of the biblical image of God as a rock. For example, in the image of the person who builds their house on a rock, rather than shifting stand right at the end of Matthew chapter 7. The point here is that God is about security, stability. We possess value because we are valued and accepted and enabled to cope with the challenges of life from a secure base. We are rooted and grounded in a God who loves us, even though we're very small in the midst of a vast universe. So I suppose we could talk about the transvaluation of human life through being touched by God, a theme, incidentally, that's found throughout the poetic writings of George Herbert, a poet who I am very fond of. In fact, in one of his poems, Herbert compares the graceful touch of God as being like the fabled philosopher's stone of medieval alchemy, just as the philosopher's stone transmutes, transforms base metal into gold. So God transforms the value of individuals through grace. Let me read you these lines because I think you'll see how they really speak into this concern. This is the famous stone that turneth all to gold, for that which God doth touch and own cannot for less be told. God has touched each of us and owns us. We are precious. We are, as the medieval writer Julian of Norwich famously put it, enfolded in the love of Christ, which brings a new sense of security, identity, and value. And once we come to see ourselves enfolded by Christ, we come to see ourselves in a new way, as someone who's loved, welcomed, and valued. Now, these are all really powerful themes, and I want you to think through how you could use these to help other people grasp at least something of this new world of seeing things and acting that Christianity makes possible. We all need a secure base, just like the wise person who builds a house on the rock, rather than the foolish person who builds a house 
on the sand. We do need something that can withstand the storms and floods of life, something that's stable and secure. Do you remember the old hymn, Rock of Ages? It's still a firm favourite, um, even though it's written a long time ago. Here's how it opens, listen to this. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. You see the point? Christ is our safe place, not to escape from the world, but to serve as a refuge while we grow in strength and prepare to re-enter the world to try and make it a better place. Well, a lot more could be said, but let's move on now to our last component of the idea of meaning, which is the question of purpose. Why am I here? Why are you here? We've all asked those questions, I'm sure. I think it's important to be clear that answering the scientific question of how we came to be here is not the same as asking the deep existential question of why we are here. I think it's natural for us to ask what we are meant to be doing, developing a notion of calling, not understood as something that we would like to do, but something that we ought to do. And maybe you know this quote from uh, the 19th century religious writer, John Henry Newman. Listen to this and see if this speaks to you. God has created me to do him some definite service. He's committed some work to me, which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. Now, I want you to think about those words, because as I'm sure you will have noticed, this links up with the words of the psychologist Michael Steger, who I quoted earlier in this lecture. And Steger linked the idea of finding meaning in life with discovering, I quote, some purpose, mission, or overarching aim for our lives. So, we feel it's important to identify what we're meant to be doing and see where this takes us. So I think there are lots of things we could say here. Um, one of the key points is that being reassured that there is purpose and meaning in life really helps us cope with the ambiguity and bewilderment of this world. And this point was emphasized by Viktor Frankl, whose experiences in Nazi concentration camp led him to realize the importance of discerning meaning in coping with traumatic situations, because their survival very often depended on the will to live. And that depended on discernment of meaning and purpose in even the most demoralizing situations, particularly those experienced as threats to survival and self-preservation. And Frankel noted that those who could best with these very difficult situations were those who had frameworks of meaning that enabled them to accommodate their experiences within their mental maps and see them in a new light, see them as having purpose. In other words, they had a why. They knew what was about. Frankl quoted the German philosopher Nietzsche in making this point. And Nietzsche wrote, the person who has a why to live for can cope with almost any how. And that's a very important point. Without the capacity to make sense of events and situations and see purpose in them and purpose in us, it's very hard to cope with reality. We need a mental map of reality that helps us to see what we are meant to be doing, but also to see what happens to us as very often ways of developing our sense of calling. And that's why this idea of Christianity offering us a big picture is just so important. It's important apologetically, and there are lots of points I think that we could make here. Let me uh, mention one of them, which is that Christianity offers us a map which sees us how we can position ourselves in life and do something special, something that really matters. And there's another point here, which is that Christianity supplements or enriches this important idea of having a purpose with a really important theme of God's grace. So that we are enabled by God to achieve what might otherwise lie beyond our grasp. So in this lecture, we've looked at the importance of the idea of meaning and also how we can engage this theme apologetically. Now, I must emphasize something here, and that is that this is not about opportunistically inventing something. 
Rather, it's about ensuring that the meaning-making aspect of Christianity, which is real, is fully appreciated. So it's time for us to move on. And I want us to engage with some difficulties or concerns that some people experience about Christianity. And so in the next lecture, I'm going to reflect with you on how we can deal with objections to Christianity in general, as well as focusing on some representative and important concerns that need to be addressed by people like you and me. So I look forward to speaking to you again very soon.